said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord. Gracious unto me, O God, according to thy mercy. According to the multitude of thy compassions, wipe away my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is continually before me. Against thee, against thee alone, I have sinned, and have done evil. Create for me a clean heart, O God, and renew a firm spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy face, and take not the spirit of thy holiness from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and that spirit of free will uphold me. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall tell of thy grace. Sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. So in that day you shall say, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is Jehovah. We have waited for him. We will rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses. And we forgive those who trespass against us. The Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord keep watch over the city, the keeper watches in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, eating the bread of grief, so he gives to his beloved sleep. Please be seated.
Hear the word of the Lord, first as it is written in the Gospel of Luke, part of chapter 22. And the day of unleavened bread came, in which the Passover must be slaughtered. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go, prepare for us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said to him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said to them, Behold, as you come into the city, a man shall meet you, carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he goes in. And you shall say to the householder of the house, The teacher says to thee, Where is the inn where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished. There prepare. And going, they found it as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour had come, he reclined, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, With longing, I have longed to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you that I will not eat of it any more until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And receiving the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you that I will not drink of the produce of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And taking bread, he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. We read further in the word of the Lord's second coming, first in true Christian religion number 89. Divine order requires that man should prepare himself for the reception of God. And in proportion as he prepares himself, God enters into him as into his dwelling place and home. And this preparation is effected by means of knowledges about God and the spiritual things pertaining to the church, and thus by means of intelligence and wisdom. For it is a law of order that in proportion as man approaches and comes near to God, which he must do wholly as if of himself, so far God approaches and comes near to man and conjoins himself with man in man's interiors. It was in accordance with this order that the Lord progressed even to a oneness with his Father. We read further from number 726 in the chapter on the Holy Supper. Without being conjoined with the Lord, everlasting life and salvation are impossible because he is himself both of these, everlasting life and salvation. It is clear from passages in the word that he is everlasting life, including this from John. Jesus Christ is the true God and everlasting life. The first epistle of John, chapter 5. He is also salvation, because salvation and everlasting life are one and the same thing. His name Jesus also means salvation, and he is for this reason all over the Christian world given the title of Savior. Still, only those approach the Holy Supper worthily who are inwardly conjoined with the Lord. Those are inwardly conjoined with the Lord who have been regenerated. Who the regenerate are has been shown in the chapter on Reformation and Regeneration. There are many besides who confess the Lord and do good to the neighbor, but they are not regenerated unless they do this out of love towards the neighbor and faith in the Lord. For in doing good to the neighbor they can be motivated solely by reasons that concern the world or themselves, but not the neighbor as such. Their deeds are purely natural, with no spiritual content hidden within them. For such people make a confession of the Lord only with their mouths and lips, while their hearts are far away. 
Real love towards the neighbor and real faith come only from the Lord, and both are conferred upon a person when he of his own free will does good on the natural level to the neighbor and believes truths with his reason and looks to the Lord, doing all these three things because of the commandments in the word. Then the Lord plants charity and faith in his midst and makes both of these spiritual. So the Lord conjoins a person to himself, and the person conjoins himself to the Lord, for conjunction is impossible if it is not reciprocal. Here end our lessons. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. The Holy Supper symbolizes the happiness of heaven. The Lord keenly desires to share heavenly happiness with us, so he invites us to eat and drink with him. Still, he keeps us free to accept or reject his invitation. If we want to accept it, we must prepare ourselves so we are ready to come into his house. 
As the Holy Supper represents introduction into heaven, preparing ourselves for the Holy Supper is the same thing as preparing for heaven. It is illustrated in the story of how the disciples prepared to eat the Passover and the first Holy Supper with the Lord. The Lord chose Peter and John to prepare the Passover. Peter stands for faith in the Lord and understanding the word. John stands for that understanding brought into life, into action. The desire to learn from the Lord, Peter, and to do what he says, John, are the two most important ways by which the Lord sends us to get ready to eat the Passover, that is, to enjoy the life of heaven. When the disciples asked the Lord where he wanted them to prepare for the feast, he sent them to the city, saying, A man will meet you, carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. A city represents doctrinal truths, that is, truths we have learned as the Lord's teachings. The intersecting streets of a city make a picture of interconnected avenues of thought. A pitcher of water corresponds to knowledge from the Word. Things we know from the Word hold the truth for us in our minds. We know the Golden Rule, the Two Great Commandments, the Ten Commandments, and we know these are from the Lord's Word, not human inventions. These and other teachings from the Word hold our principles as a pitcher holds water. The man with the pitcher would lead them to a certain house. Houses in the Word represent good states, like the love that characterizes a good home. Taken together, these details of the spiritual sense show that to prepare for heaven, a person ought to look for teachings from the Word. When we do, the knowledge we gain leads us to ideas of what really good states are, states in which we can be the Lord's guests in His home, even His family. From the Word, we learn about heaven. We learn about honesty, cleanness of mind and heart, generosity, kindness, hard work, sobriety, patriotism, conjugal love, love of infants, and other ideals. We learn about the Lord Himself and His example of love and wisdom and service to others. This learning is the man with the pitcher of water leading us to a good place where we can prepare to have a holy supper with the Lord. The heavenly doctrine emphasizes that regeneration is not possible without truths. Truths form our understanding of who God is and how He wants us to live. As we learn more, especially from the spiritual sense of the word, our thinking becomes clearer and stronger. Merely worldly ideas are filtered out, such as merit or care for the morrow. With clearer thinking, our affections and motives can be purified as well. We learn to recognize other people as our neighbors, despite their failings and ours. We can learn how to behave toward our spouse, our children, our employer or employees, the people next door, and so forth. As we learn and practice, our attitudes slowly change for the better. The two disciples were instructed to say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Jesus told them the man would show them a large upper room furnished where they could get everything ready. The upper room in the house of our minds is called the rational mind in the writings. It is called rational in contrast to our instinctive or natural reactions. It is the level on which we think things through carefully, instead of just reacting emotionally. Conscience is on the rational level. Our sense of what is fair and right, 
true and good is in the rational mind. All spiritual affections which are distinctly human belong to the rational mind, whereas other appetites and emotions shared with animals belong to the natural mind. Every affection for what is eternal, such as the hope of eternal life and of an eternal marriage, is a rational affection. During regeneration, first we learn some things about what is good and true and what is evil and false. We learn what will lead others and ourselves to happiness and what will lead to misery. Then we determine to steer away from what is evil and false in order to live for what is good and true. On the rational level of our minds, we make up our minds to live rightly. This is where we first meet the Lord as adults. This is the part of our mind where we accept Him into our lives as our God and Savior and form our attachment and loyalty to Him. But then a struggle begins between the rational mind and the natural mind, between spiritual affections and merely natural affections. From our rational mind, we use the truths we have learned to examine our instinctive thoughts and delights, as well as the actions and habits they cause. We try to exercise self-discipline to control our habits and the thoughts and attitudes we allow ourselves to dwell on. From our natural mind, we feel a sense of loss in giving up certain things in which we find pleasure. So a battle arises within ourselves. The severity depends on the extent to which we have allowed wrong attitudes and disorderly habits to become entrenched. But the Lord teaches that if we examine ourselves only once or twice a year when we are approaching the Holy Supper and then abstain from one or more evils that we discover, we will sense a change of heart. A large upper room in our minds will begin to be furnished with good, peaceful states that come from acting rationally, sensibly from the Word. We will feel closer to the Lord. The bread of the Holy Supper represents actually doing good to the neighbor and especially a change of heart so that we begin to enjoy doing what is good, not for praise and money but because it's satisfying to do. The wine of the Holy Supper represents new insights into the truth and stronger conviction in truths we have learned before. The Lord gave us the Holy Supper as a symbol of our life's goal, entrance into heaven, where we can be close to the one who truly loves us and frees us from all our sins. The Lord knows that heaven often seems remote, many difficult years away and intangible. So does the Lord himself often seem far away from us. So he gave us the Holy Supper as a continual reminder that he is always with us, feeding us and lifting us up, and that the kingdom of God is within us. Each time we come to the Lord to receive the Holy Supper, we should think of it as a chance to take another step closer to Him. It is a way of entering more and more into His heavenly kingdom, even now, while living on earth. So let's try every day to prepare the house of our minds as a place to have supper with the Lord. Amen. Now,
please be seated.